The human brain is divided into three major parts. The cerebrum, which is responsible for more of the higher brain functions, the cerebellum, which coordinates the activities of the brain, and the brainstem, which basically keeps us alive and allows the brain and body to communicate. The largest part of the brain is the cerebrum. It is where all of the different sensory information is received and interpreted. Uh, all of our movements are initiated because of this part of the brain. We analyze information, reason, experience emotion, uh, have consciousness, will, volition, set goals. All of the things that make human life possible are centered mostly in the cerebrum. We have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. The right hemisphere represents things. It controls the left side of the body. It sets every object in our awareness into a time and a space. The uh, left hemisphere is the categorical hemisphere and enables us to understand uh, the context of objectivity that we're aware of, the meaning of it. Uh, these things work together in tandem to create human consciousness. On each side of the cerebrum, we have lobes that are connected to each other by function, and all the nerve bundles in there are all connected, so that that's how we know these parts work together. Uh, we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Each one of these has a different function, and there's a part on each side. So you have a frontal lobe on the right side and a frontal lobe on the left side. Uh, likewise with the temporal and parietal and occipital lobes. The one part of the brain that humans have that is in greater uh, dimension than other animals is the prefrontal cortical area, the frontal area of the brain. Uh, the very back parts of this frontal area are involved in voluntary movement. As we move forward, we get in more uh, controlled movements, of fine motor movements, awarenesses, automatic behaviors, ability to concentrate, uh, and so forth. So uh, all of the goal attainment, working memory, uh, everything that we know of as conscious control of ourself, impulse control, monitoring, all of that stuff is s centered in the activities of the frontal area, particularly the prefrontal area. One thing about most drugs of abuse is they downgrade the frontal lobe activity. So as we see the frontal lobe become less present in human consciousness, what we see is someone that's more emotionally controlled and less able to control their impulses and compulsions. Moving back on the surface of the cerebrum, we have the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. The occipital lobe is at the very back of the brain, mostly associated with vision and reading. Uh, the parietal lobe, uh, right behind the frontal lobe, is involved in the sense of touch, the appreciation of form through touch, so you feel uh, a ball or a pyramid or a block or something like that, you can tell. Uh, response to internal stimuli, this is proprioception, uh, sensory combination, comprehension, and of course this area is really greatly affected by LSD and uh, the hallucinogens. Uh, some language and reading and also some visual functions are connected with the parietal lobe. The temporal lobe on the sides of the brain are very, very important in our understanding of what it means to be a human being. And also, these are involved in uh, the process of addiction and memory. And since addiction is something that involves uh, automatic memory of emotional events, uh, strong memories and motivations from that, uh, this lobe is very important. We'll be talking about it more when we talk about addiction. Uh, for one, uh, memory, hearing, uh, vision a little bit, language, music, uh, fear is processed in the amygdala, uh, in the hippocampus, uh, parts of this. Uh, some behavior, uh, the emotional uh, connections with memory, uh, and our sense of identity uh, through the insula, which is right underneath the parietal lobe in towards what we'll see later as the limbic area. Right underneath the uh, cerebrum, we have the cerebellum, which actually in Greek means the little brain. Uh, the cerebellum is responsible for coordinating not only physical movements, but thoughts and behavioral processes. And finally, in the gross structure of the brain, we have the brain stem. This is the motor sensory pathway to the body, the face, uh, every other aspect of the body, including the heart, the breathing, the blood pressure, all of these things are regulated through the brainstem. 
Uh, it's also an area where uh, a lot of the neurochemicals we'll be talking about later are uh, synthesized and originate from things like dopamine, serotonin, uh, acetylcholine, uh, norepinephrine, uh, all have uh, their origins uh, in the uh, brainstem. Uh, this is the thing the SWAT team will shoot if you uh, have a hostage because once you uh, damage the brainstem, uh, the rest of the body stops. Uh, that's one of the dangers of a lot of drugs that have an effect on down-regulating different parts of the brain. If they down-regulate the brain stem, uh, then usually we have cardiac failure and uh, respiratory failure and uh, people crash and oftentimes die from that. If we cut the brain right down the middle, we can see on the inside here the inner brain. Uh, deep inside here, uh, we can see how all of the different structures, the brain stem, the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and all of the ways they interact uh, are uh, presented. Uh, they're not only uh, in, in this part of the brain, we can, we can see the limbic area, uh, the parts that uh, in, are involved in the emotional quality and emotional reinforcement, behavioral reinforcement, almost everything involved in addiction that we will talk about uh, as we go along in this uh, presentation uh, has to do with the inner parts of the brain and how they orchestrate the fundamental roots of human consciousness that later become apparent in human behavior. In this peculiar diagram we see how the limbic areas of the brain uh, are connected to the rest of the brain here. Uh, you can see the areas right here that are uh, mostly uh, shaded with turquoise and purple uh, connected to the eyes. Uh, you can see the eyes connected to the thalamus here. Uh, then the uh, different parts of the limbic area of the brain then come down from that. We'll explore these in greater depth. These are some of the major structures of the limbic area. We have the amygdala, which is the area that uh, infuses our awareness with uh, emotional connection and this is all happening everything that happens in this area is done before we're even conscious of it so uh, the amygdala is our fear processor it's also our uh, gradient processor for emotional stimuli and that way we determine how much incentive we have uh, for our behavior based upon how much the amygdala registers uh, the uh, hippocampus over here on the uh, right side uh, and, and the left, of course we've got one on each side, uh, is the area that indexes memory. It gives us a sense of place and time. It also um, gives us uh, an awareness of patterns. Uh, these patterns are then uh, uh, examined by the amygdala. Uh, the putamen is uh, a circuit going from the uh, thalamus, which is at the top, this is a dark area. That's the major switching center of the brain. Uh, it hooks into the putamen, and the putamen then uh, communicates back and forth from the thalamus to the hippocampus, and then uh, information is taken uh, as it comes in uh, to the thalamus and then sent to all different parts of the brain. Uh, so anyway, these areas, the amygdala, the thalamus, the putamen, hippocampus, hypothalamus, and also uh, the pineal gland, uh, pineal gland here uh, ara uh, regulates arousal uh, that is involved in craving and waking up uh, and going to sleep. Uh, the hypothalamus down here uh, sets the uh, adrenaline flow in the body, tells us when we're hungry, when we need to eat, communicates uh, enzymes uh, back and forth from the brain to the body. So here we have the amygdala uh, as the small red area, the hippocampus. Uh, the anterior cingulate here is at the front part. This is all called, uh, this area that is uh, green is called the cingulate cortex. And then finally at the end of that we have the striatum uh, and the nucleus accumbens uh, and then the uh, hypothalamus and the hippocampal areas here. Uh, these all constitute what's often been called since the 1950s the limbic system. Uh, there have been arguments about whether or not that's a good way of describing it, but it basically this area of the brain sets the emotional tone of everything else that we're experienced. Uh, it filters everything that we sense, every sensation we have 
uh, it values it and stores it on the basis of how valuable it is for our survival. Uh, it tags events as important. This is all part of the process of addiction. It's also the part, process of learning. Uh, it stores these highly charged emotional memories. It uh, modulates all of our motivation, controls our uh, appetite, uh, our uh, awakeness, our sleep cycles, our craving, our compulsion, our impulse. Uh, it promotes bonding. Uh, processes the sense of smell directly right into the amygdala. It's the oldest sense that we have. Uh, it modulates all of our libido and sexual behavior. And almost everything that we find here uh, associated with uh, malfunctions of this system are the psychiatric problems that we all read about. Uh, moodiness, irritability, clinical depression, uh, increased negative thinking, uh, perceiving events in a negative way, uh, increased or decreased motivation, uh, negative emotions, manic emotions, uh, appetite, sleep problems, decreased sexual responsiveness, social isolation, bipolar, schizoform disorders, all of these things fall in here. And you will find as you deal with people who are drug abusers that this is more about what they're like. They're like people who are mentally ill. They act more on the basis of those things occurring in their limbic system, and they're unable to control that behavior by using the frontal parts of the brain that we talked about just a moment ago. As we look more into these limb structures of the limbic area, we can see the thalamus, which is the center of the picture here. And right below that, we have the hypothalamus. It's connected right next to the amygdala and the hippocampus and all the different parts of the inner workings of the brain here, the limbic areas. The hypothalamus is really interesting. It's the part that sets up our automatic stress response. So when you're walking along in the woods and you see something brown and it's large and you respond immediately as if you've encountered a bear, uh, this automatically processes that. You're not even conscious by the time these enzymes have gotten into your blood, activated adrenaline uh, from the adrenal glands and over by the kidneys, and cortisol then goes completely throughout the, the blood system. Cortisol then turns into uh, something that actually modifies the brain and changes the body in a large way. That's why stress kills. It also is very important in understanding some of the uh, things that happen during addiction. So anyway, the hypothalamus uh, wakes you up in the morning. It uh, gets your adrenaline flowing. It's uh, very important in your moods, your motivation. Uh, hormonally, it's important for sexual maturation. Uh, it helps regulate temperature by working with the brain stem. And it's also involved with almost all of the hormonal body processes uh, all the way into the uh, thyroid, into the uh, medulla of the uh, adrenal glands, and so forth. So uh, it really sets up all of the emotional interact. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, enzymatic um, interactions uh, with the body uh, over a period of uh, uh, just a few seconds uh, after you've experienced an emotional moment. Uh, the thalamus on the top here is the major clearinghouse. It's, it's the switchboard of the brain, and uh, LSD will affect that, and it'll start sending uh, uh, information from one sensory area to another, and they call that synesthesia when the senses overlap. So we'll see more about that as we talk about LSD. Looking deeper into the inner brain, the limbic area, we see the hippocampus here. Uh, it actually extends on downward to the amygdala, and uh, it's a tiny little nub there. It acts as a memory indexer. It sends the memories out to the appropriate parts of the brain for long-term storage, retrieving them. But it also tells us where we are, when we are. So people with post-traumatic stress sometimes have emotions, and then the hippocampus shuts down because of stress, and they lose their sense of context. That's why they have this experience that goes uh, uh, kind of crazy, and they don't, uh, they, they don't seem to have a context to make sense of their emotions. Uh, the basal ganglia, uh, this is an area actually that's just a, a lot of the different parts of uh, what we call the limbic area. That's just another way of talking about it. 
We've got the thalamus, the uh, uh, globus pallidus, the putamen, the caudate nucleus, the fornix, uh, and then on into some of the others. This basically, uh, uh, these areas then uh, integrate our feeling, our movement, the automatic behavioral processes. Um, they uh, uh, work with motor behaviors and also cognitive behaviors. Uh, anxiety is involved here, motivation, and also the pleasure centers of the brain going from the brain stem here in the uh, um, ventral tegmental area all the way up to the nucleus accumbens in the striatal part of the front part of the basal ganglia there. Uh, that actually is called the pleasure pathway and we'll talk about that as we go farther into the material here. And here we have the uh, connection between the hypothalamus here at the bottom of this area and then the pituitary. The pituitary then is shown in the larger diagram and has different parts. Each part is responsible for something that is released into the bloodstream. So as we experience, for example, fear or uh, some type of motivation, uh, we uh, have enzymes that correspond to that that are released into the body. Uh, this going from the... Uh, 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 hypothalamus to the pituitary down into the adrenal glands and causing the stress response in the body which releases adrenaline into the bloodstream and also cortisol uh, that process is called the HPA axis and is very important in understanding drugs of abuse and how people react because when people go into panic they lose the ability of the frontal lobe to work they go into automatic behaviors that are based on this stress response and automatic responses that are uh, related back to survival. Uh, you'll run into this, and this is one of the dangers in dealing uh, with people that are on drugs, especially stimulants like methamphetamine, uh, cocaine, uh, also people on K2 and some of those uh, hallucinogens, um, also PCP, and quite often uh, even with uh, heroin and opioids as people are coming off of these or craving them they go into this uh, survival mode so that uh, HPA axis uh, activates the stress response which activates automatic behavior get you ready for fight or flight and as a result these folks can be quite dangerous And here we see if we slice the brain down the middle, uh, it enables us to see the amygdala in a different way uh, and some of the other brain structures. But right uh, at the bottom here, we have the amygdala, and we can see it uh, then forms on each side of the brain stem. Uh, the thalamus, it's right below the thalamus, right next to the hippocampus. And the amygdala is what tells us whether we're in danger. It also tells us the emotional value, and this emotions doesn't mean necessarily I have conscious emotions. It's uh, unconscious emotions. It's a valence. It's a, connected, a connectivity to the survival value. They call it incentive saliency uh, in the literature. And so uh, the amygdala attaches incentive saliency and coordinates behaviors uh, automatically with the body that are before we're conscious that happen without our volition, without our ability to think about them. Uh, in law enforcement, this is quite often the case with uh, a gunfight, for example. We don't have time to do a lot of thinking. Uh, what we end up having to do is react. And so this is the reaction part of the brain. It's a very dangerous part uh, for law enforcement uh, when people are working uh, completely off of their amygdala. And this is quite common with drugs of abuse. As we take a closer look at the amygdala, we can uh, examine how the actual biology of it works with uh, an, an event that happens in our life. Uh, a sound occurs, and the auditory uh, part of the brain then speaks to the amygdala. It immediately goes from the thalamus to the uh, auditory cortex. Uh, that sound, let's say it's something that causes an immediate behavior, goes to what's called the central nucleus of the amygdala, which sends a signal to the hypothalamus to put us in a stress uh, fight or flight situation. It sends a, a signal to the brain stem to flinch, to freeze, to start fighting. And then only after that does it go back down here. It sends something up to the regular part of the brain 
that gives us an emotional experience and we can then evaluate what the amygdala is doing. I'll show this in the next slide. So as we have that sound occur, the auditory thalamus then uh, immediately sends the signal down to the amygdala. The amygdala then immediately starts our behaviors, freezing, blood pressure change, stress hormones, startle reflexes. Uh, it also involves the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the part that uh, initiates a defensive behavior or a learned response. Uh, the hippocampus invests this with an emotional uh, contextuality and a pattern recognition. And finally, all of this goes up to the auditory cortex, which is the part of the brain that actually evaluates things. And then that goes down to the medial fr frontal cortex, that then controls or re-regulates the behavior. So imme immediately people respond. This is involved in the certain types of psychosis that are associated with stimulant use, uh, meth psychosis. People stay uh, cured up in this area. Uh, where they're uh, immediately responding to their environment and they're in the fight or flight mode quite often. Very, very dangerous for law enforcement and emergency workers at all levels. The amygdala can be trained so we can learn a threat and we can also learn a response to that threat. So this is what uh, automatic training, it's what muscle memory is oftentimes called. Uh, but the uh, threat occurs uh, the sensory systems give it to the amygdala, which gives it to the motor systems of the body, which are the basal ganglia. And then our defensive responses automatically start after that. Uh, this is the way we respond to our environment. And the more we do this, the more our brain wires this way. Because what fires together, wires together. And uh, that means that our brain, the neuroplasticity of the brain is continually changing the brain to be more like what we're doing with it. Uh, that's why it's important to have good habits. So anyway, uh, this can be learned. Uh, it's what's the basis of a lot of uh, emergency professions like uh, jet fighter pilot uh, uh, training or military training, law enforcement training, emergency services training, so forth. Uh, all of this becomes automatic behavior after a while. Uh, so the amygdala and the way we have automatic behaviors in response to a crisis uh, can and, and is trained oftentimes. Neuroscientist uh, Joseph Ledoux uh, has done extensive research with this emotional uh, amygdala response to our environment. And we can see this diagram. He characterizes uh, one way of dealing with the environment as the low road uh, and that is that the uh, stimuli comes into the thalamus, it goes to the amygdala, immediately we have an emotional response. And we're not conscious of this per se. It doesn't, hasn't entered our arena of being conscious yet. Um, on the other hand, this emotional stimuli uh, comes into the thalamus. At the same time, it's sent up on a slower route uh, to the parts of the brain called the sensory cortex, uh, which then go into the prefrontal area and uh, evaluate what's going on here. These will correct the amygdala and uh, as we see in uh, the decrease of this frontal area of the brain, the frontal lobes uh, in drugs of abuse, um, we'll see uh, more and more disinvolvement of the frontal areas, the part that evaluate this. So we'll see this uh, corrective uh, movement or corrective action of the frontal area of the brain on the emotional area of the brain uh, become disconnected and it won't happen. So people will be more emotional, they'll be less in control, and they will be more uh, prone to violence and panic and fear. Uh, so this uh, was done, uh, this uh, high road and low road uh, was done by Joseph Ledoux. Uh, people uh, that are drug abusers are oftentimes caught in a uh, cycle of living in this low road. And here we see how all of these things work. Uh, the hippocampus gives our context, uh, the amygdala and the ventral tegmental area going up to the nucleus accumbens give our, our savoring and satisfaction. Um, the uh, uh, orbital frontal con uh, uh, 
cortex gives us our ability to appraise this and to judge it. Uh, the insula, which is in the uh, temporal lobe, uh, gives us our sense of self and identity and uh, feeling. Uh, habits are involved in the dorsal striatum. This is all part of the uh, basal ganglia. And the amygdala sets our reactivity tone. All of this is the mix uh, that constitutes the day-to-day -day, uh, ruling by the limbic system of people who are involved in using drugs uh, for abuse or have uh, suffered brain injuries because of drug abuse. And so we've seen how the brain constitutes who we are, what we are, everything that we know, everything that we do. To fully understand drug abuse, it's necessary to understand the workings in structure and function of the target organ of drugs, the brain. Emphasizing everything that we're aware of, what we see, know, feel, touch, dream, all the concepts, world, universe, reason, God, everything that we have access to in life. In fact, the human form of life itself is due to the activity of the brain. As the brain changes, so does our world. Things look different, have different significance, and we see ourselves differently. Our behavior becomes altered to match the change in conscious life. Drugs alter the brain, therefore altering conscious life. We are our brains. We change our life with drugs.